It is great to be back at the Y. Great to be here with my former editor, John Meacham. That's why I went into TV. <laughs> so you decided to tackle a living president. I did. You did. And I, I want to go back to the moment. Um, take us inside the room yeah. when you broach this subject with George Bush and say, I want to write your biography. Sure. It was uh, around 2006. I first met him in 1998. Uh, I'd gone up to Kennebunkport with our friend Michael Beschloss. Um, and like thousands, tens of thousands of other people, had been immediately impressed by his quiet, persistent charisma. Uh, I had an idea, and it, he'd sort of been stuck in my mind as Dana Carvey, really. Um, and I had been an undergraduate uh, at Sewanee when he, during most of his presidency, which is a combination of Downton Abbey and Deliverance. Um, uh, and I had a really good friend in those years. Y'all may know him. He's a good man. His name is Jack Daniels. And so I was a little fuzzy on some of the uh, presidential facts uh, at that point. So I had this fairly caricatured vision. There had also been this very young man uh, who helped uh, a governor from Arkansas in 1992 defeat him. Uh, and so the Clinton campaign had done a very good job of portraying him as out of touch, out of time. But when I met him, I was struck by, as again, many other people are, his grace, his generosity. But also, I understood the ambient sense of power that he could project. He's totally unlike Bill Clinton in that, that his, Clinton's charisma is such that he can do big, he can do wholesale, he can do retail. Bush can really, <laughs> really only do retail charisma. But he did it persistently, persistently, persistently. And I think I knew then that there was a book there, ultimately. Uh, Michael, again, Beschloss has a great rule that you can only really dis know this truth about a presidency insofar as we can 20 to 25 years after. And I also knew that because President Bush took a very long view of history, he was very affected, I think, by his time in China, um, which, as you'll remember, Henry Kissinger once asked Mao what he made of the French Revolution, and Mao said, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> um, so he, Bush imbued a great deal of that. So about six years later, seven years later, uh, I went to them and said, I'd like to do a set of embargoed interviews for a biography. It would have to be after the son was out of office, obviously. But the son's been reelected. So He's been reelected. Um, so I, I do that. I mean, it, it was hard enough the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, what I... In, in a classic George Bush move, he was skeptical that there was enough there. And he actually said, well, what if you find an empty deck of cards? Which is a classic George Bush malapropism, because he meant empty suit or not a full deck of cards. <laughs> but he did. And I, I, I was sitting in his office. He has an office in College Station where the library is. I remember exactly where we were. Um, and I was making the case. I said, look, Mr. President, you're, you're, the, you're the last president of the generation. You were shot down out of the sky. Um, you, you, your life has embodied the values of a generation that's passing. He had very little interest in that because I think like the best members of that generation, he didn't see his combat as anything particular. He saw it as his duty. But then I moved into the presidency and I said, and I also believe that more things happen to you in four years than often happens to any other president in eight. And that sort of perked him up uh, a mm -hmm. bit. And then he said, well, do you want to look at the diary? Being an ace reporter, I said, <laughs> yes, Mr. President. Well, you really dug it out of him, huh? Yeah, you know, <laughs> we were in a parking garage, you know. <laughs> When they make the movie, Hal Holbrook will be me, you know. Um, uh, so, yeah. So, um, so but a couple of months later, I went to his office in Houston, and I sat in, uh, he has one office with a lot of windows and then a conference room behind him where <laughs> it was a little intimidating. It's where, you know, presidents get lots of gifts. 
and um, he, the, people sent him a lot of shotguns through the years. So all of his firearms, it is Texas after all, uh, are all in this room. So I was sitting there in this armory, basically, um, reading the diary. I, I chose not to see any connection between the two. Um, and I'll never forget, I, I called Michael, actually, uh, who's a dear friend, at that time, reading the first few pages of the presidential diary and realizing this is as close as I'm ever going to get to being president of the United States. Mm -hmm because he's talking about what it felt like. He's complaining that Nancy Reagan didn't let Barbara look at the house until January 11th. Um, he talks about he's briefed on his nuclear responsibilities and when he's going to get the card and how it works. And he says, stark, stark. Um, and it's just this amazing sense of sitting there with him. And I'm convinced that it's a better diary. I'm convinced the book is better, not be because he was writing it. Because when you write, you're always thinking about how someone's going to read it. But he was really talking to himself. And because part of his code from his mother, from his father, was you never complained, you never, talk, you know, you, you never whined. He once told me, he said, no one ever wants to hear a president of the United States complain about, oh, the loneliness of the job. You're just damn lucky to be there. So maybe you can't answer this question, but why does he trust you with the diary? Why does he trust you with the book? I, it, Episcopalian? I don't know. Uh, uh, there are only four of us, and so <laughs> <laughs> I had a one in three shot. Um, um, I don't. I don't. I can't answer that really. I, I think. There, well, there, I, I have. I can speculate. One is I was working for Newsweek. Um, the Bush family and Newsweek did not have what we would call diplomatic relations. <laughs> Do you uh, all remember 1987, the Wimp Factor? That was the Newsweek cover that he, that he never forgot. He, if he were sitting right here, he could tell you uh, all about the Wimp Factor. He hated it. One of my talking points back was that I was in high school when it ran, <laughs> um, uh, which, which is true. I think um, he, won, he didn't want to write a memoir. Uh, he wanted a serious historical look. I was seen, I think fairly unfairly, depends on the issue, as sort of center left. Um, I was a journalist with a magazine with which he had feuded. So if I, the judgments I came to would have more credibility than a more, a more explicitly conservative historian, I think. Um, that's my best guess. Any uh, conditions on his part? None, none. He gave me the audio, he gave me the transcripts, he gave me the vice presidential transcripts, he opened the vault in the library, uh, he granted me as many hours as I wanted. Uh, he was always polite, usually patient. Um, he dislikes being put on the couch, but that's what I had to do. Um, we did a lot of crying. It was like the world's worst wasp on wasp therapy. Um, <laughs> And we can talk about those moments. Um, the other thing I think that sealed it, honestly, was I said, I'm not on a deadline here. You know, I want this to be right. And I'm, this is not about the son. I'm not comparing father and son. This is about you. So was it, he knew it wasn't a family history. No. And, 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 and it shouldn't be uh, because... At some point, King David was just King David. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't always precursor. And I remember sitting with his chief of staff, a wonderful woman named Jean Becker, who made the project possible in many ways. Uh, the two powerful women who made it possible were Mrs. Bush and, and Jean. And he said, well, how much time are you talking about in terms of interviews? And I said, not much. I'll come down two or three times a year, you know, and it'll be fine, and if, if you don't want to talk, we won't talk. He said, okay, so you don't want to go steady. I said, no, <laughs> I don't want to go steady, but I want to talk to you, and I'll put it in the drawer, and we'll do it after you're gone. Did he think when he started talking to you about this that his family, once George W. Was, would be out of office two years down the road, um, that the Bush family was done with politics? Did he envision Jeb? I think he envisioned Jeb. I think he, very early on in the transcripts, he talks about how he hoped Jeb would run. Um, he knew at that point that George P. had an interest. Uh, 
you know, I, I think he saw the story unfolding in the way perhaps Senator Bush saw the story unfolding. Um, but he does believe in history. He reads a lot more history than he lets on. That brings me back to something that really startled me at the beginning of the book. Having watched George Bush for a long time, I worked in a campaign against him. It seemed like from the outside that these were sort of positions he kind of fell into one after yeah. another. But you go back at the beginning of the book, his dad is talking about him running for president in like 1950s. In the 50s, the 50s. There are three great moments here. The reason we call it destiny and power is that he, he did have a sense of destiny that he was meant to serve on the largest possible stage. Uh, after he shot down on, it's Veterans Day, uh, he was shot down on Saturday, September 2nd, 1944. Uh, he loses two crewmen. That was one of the occasions where he cried with me. Um, he thinks about them every day, Del Delaney and Ted White. Um, he, he has two concerns about that. One was, did he do enough to save them? And the answer was yes, he, he followed protocol. And the second was, why was I spared? And here's this young man who at 18 years old, three things happened on his 18th birthday. He turned 18, he graduated from Andover, and he signed up to go to war. Um, why was I spared? I think that was a foundation of, I need to be commensurate with my salvation. I have been given a great gift. And then the second was the loss of their daughter, Robin, in 1953. And I asked what he had learned from that, uh, what he had taken away from that. And he said that life is unpredictable and fragile and that every moment counted. So I think, already wired to be competitive, to race forward. I think these two life and death experiences really did give him a sense of mission. Um, his sister, Nancy, who sort of, um, think Catherine Hepburn, um, Nancy Bush Ellis said, he was meant to be saved. Uh, his father introduced him to the French ambassador in the 1950s saying, this is my son, George. He's gonna be president of the United States one day. His father-in-law, I don't know about your father-in-law, my father-in-law has never written a letter saying, I think he's gonna be president, but, <laughs> but Marvin Pierce did. Um, and then he himself finally tunes into this oh, in 1965. I love this story. And let me tell you who fell off his chair when I told him, and it was George W. who had never heard this. In 1965, George H.W. Bush is about to run for the Congress in the seventh district of Houston. Republican district, it's going to be, a, it's unto this hour, it's a Republican district. Um, there's going to be, there's a fellow who wants to challenge him in the primary. The guy says, Bush goes to meet with him, and the, the potential opponent says, I just think you want to use this as a stepping stone to the Senate. And Bush says, no, no, I want to use it as a stepping stone to the presidency. <laughs> I don't know if I can make it, but I don't want you to foreclose that possibility. And the guy got out of the room. <laughs> the guy got out of the room. That was 1965. And so he had been thinking about a path to the presidency at least since 65. You know, you talk about um, his malapropisms. One of the things I learned when I read this book, though, is that in some ways he's kind of a poet. And it was, I was just reading it again on the, on the way over here. This letter he writes to his mom. Yeah. In the late 1950s, his daughter Robin's been gone for several years, and he, um, there's about our house in need. We need someone who's afraid of frogs. We need someone to cry when I get mad, not argue. We need a little one who can kiss without leaving egg or jam or gum. We need a girl. It's stunning stuff. Yeah. I had him read that letter out loud to me in an interview in Houston. And the door was open to his office. And long before he finished, he was sobbing in a, in a physically uncomfortable way. So much so that his chief of staff, Gene, heard what was going on and came in and said, what's going on? And I said, I asked the president to read this letter. And she said, why? And I said, because if you want to know someone's heart, and before I could finish my sentence, the president said, you have to know what breaks it. Hmm. He totally understood that. Um, 
I think part of the reason he was inarticulate, honestly, is his mind worked faster than his mouth. Um, he would often start to qualify his points on the way in, uh, as on their way out. Um, he really only, by my count, he gave two great speeches in his life. One was, <laughs> of all things, at the main convention in 1980. He pulled out a, a, a victory. <laughs> Uh, when he was supposed to lose. That was a key moment in that race. In 88. And the 88 convention speech. Um, but you know, then <laughs> he walked it back with me. He said, I asked him, what's your greatest regret? And he says, wouldn't have said, read my lips. He said, Peggy Noonan, I'm that man, all that stuff. He just, you know, they'd done everything they could to instill, they almost had to surgically implant the first person pronoun in the man's mouth because he wouldn't do it. In fact, Peggy talks about how she would just write around it, you know, went to Texas, looked for oil, ran for Congress, because that was the only way to get him to give the speech. But then what was so striking about it, and you were, you were in the opposite campaign at the time, was he actually said, I am that man. And the reason it was so politically powerful is no one had ever heard him say that. Um, but in retirement, he was still uncomfortable about it. And that campaign and the first term, as you're right, he packed so much into the first term as much as two terms for another, another president, shows the two sides of George Bush. He did whatever it took to win yep. in 1988. And once he became president, did whatever it took to govern. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a lifelong theme, and thank God for it, or this would be a very different book. Um, I think he redeemed himself again and again. And there are three examples. He, he ran as a Goldwater Republican in 1964. He opposed the Civil Rights Act, which is now a piece of legislative scripture in American life. But when he's in Congress in 68, what does he do? He votes for the Open Housing Act, which lifted racial discrimination from the real estate market, much to the fury of his constituents in Houston. There's a huge meeting at Memorial High School in Houston. People are throwing the N-word at him. They said, he told me, he said, some rich guy down here said, we didn't send you up there to help these people. But he did it. He quoted Burke saying, as, as a legislator, I don't owe you to mirror your judgment. I owe you my best opinion. And he's flying home. Uh, and we forget, George knows this. Politicians spend so much time on airplanes. It, I, there's actually a great monograph to be done about how the constricted world of an airplane affects the, the mind of a politician. But he's, <laughs> he's fl <laughs> that was a better line than I thought, actually. Um, <laughs> put that one down, George. Um, uh, but he's sitting there, and a woman comes at him. And it, you know, any boss knows this. Uh, any, uh, I'm sure George gets this on the, all the time on the streets. You know, someone's coming at you with a look in their eye, and they're going to tell they're going to tell you what all, as we say in the South. And this woman's coming at him, and he's thinking, "Oh Jesus, here we go again." And she says, "I want you to know, I'm a Democrat. I've never voted for a Republican, but I will now never vote for anyone but you." And it was this moment of relief washed over him, and he went home um, and went back to Washington. So there was that. Um, there was the brutal campaign in 1988. I don't know if you all know this, but George was the director of rapid response <laughs> for Michael Dukakis. George has been my friend for 20 years. I say this with love. That is like being the radar operator at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> um, You're right. We know okay. it would hit us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he runs. He hires Lee Atwater. Uh, he runs a tough brutal campaign. Uh, interestingly, he was way ahead of his staff. He knew, the first mention of Michael Dukakis in Bush's diary, he says, this will be easy to put into a liberal versus conservative mode before they came in with the focus groups and all that. He knew it intuitively. Um, but what does he do when he gets to Washington? He attempts, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, to create a kinder, gentler consensus culture in Washington to pass domestic legislation. He passed the ADA. He changed the structure of every building in America. He got the 1990 budget. He said, the, you know, he said, read my lips, no new taxes. He got to a point where he thought he had to do it, so he did it. 
He did what it took to amass power, but as George just said, once he had it, he tried to put the country first, directly ahead of his own political interest. And, uh, you know, he, his great regret is, is saying, read my lips. Dukakis told me a great story about uh, their post-election courtesy call, and he's, they're standing there talking, and Bush says, well, I certainly can't raise taxes in the first year. And Dukakis is like, this guy just kicked my ass <laughs> saying he'd never <laughs> raised taxes, and he's talking about in the first year. You know, it was, it was an amazing moment. But I think he redeemed himself at every point. And he knew in some ways, we're talking about 92, after the budget deal, after the triumph uh, of the first Gulf War, he, he had a sense that the work of his presidency at the, up to that point was over. Yeah. I think the work of his life was over. If you, if you look at it, I mean, biographically, you always look for the archaeological layers. So his ambient experience of Washington was 1967 to 1971, when he was in the House, two terms. Um, the first two years were under Lyndon Johnson. He's all right. George Bush is a Republican congressman from Houston. Lyndon Johnson is the most liberal president since Franklin Roosevelt, passing immense legislation to change the life in the face of the nation. For those two years, what do you think the percentage of voting, uh, the per percentage that George Bush voted with Lyndon Johnson? 53%. Now, you would think that's probably an aberration. So Nixon becomes president in 1969. That number is going to skyrocket. It does skyrocket to 55%. His reality. And he's from Texas. And he's from Texas in that district. And he called them as he saw them. Can you imagine now a member of the Republican caucus voting with Barack Obama 53% of the time? You can't because even if you could, he'd be gone in 18 months because they would primary him and he'd be out. He went to, his life was the house gym. He played paddle ball with Sonny Montgomery of Mississippi, Lud Ashley of Ohio. One of his best buddies was Dan Roskinkowski. Uh, you know, they just, uh, you worked in the house. Um, his reality was a Washington where you were with the president when it seemed right, you opposed him when it seemed wrong, and somewhat presumptuously, actually, it's, this, a lot of this is in Barber's diary, um, he actually said to Johnson in 67, I'll never demonize you, sir. Now, I'm not sure <laughs> Lyndon Johnson was all that worried about George Bush. Uh, but um, I always think of Johnson because when Bush was running for president in 1980, you know, he, and when, he, when Bush ran, he just ran all out. And he once shook the hand of a department store mannequin in, um, <laughs> in New Hampshire. Lyndon probably would have tried to register the mannequin. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but his reality was you serve presidents. So he loses in 70 to, uh, to Benson uh, and then begins those appointed jobs. And I appreciate your pointing that out. He, he m moved, maneuvered, manipulated to get each of these jobs. And not all of them were his first choice. Uh, he had the shortest White House career as an aide to Bob Haldeman of anyone in it was about 40 minutes. Um, he, thank God, I mean, can you imagine what he might have said on those tapes? Um, I mean, if Richard Nixon could turn Billy Graham into an anti-Semite, <laughs> Lord knows what he could have done with anybody else. Um, he wanted to go to the UN. Nixon wanted him to work for Haldeman. He sends, but Bush brilliantly, intuitively again, appealed to Nixon's class anxieties and said, well, Mr. President, I'll do what you want, but nobody up in New York is making a case for you. And I could go up there, I know that world, I can do it. And so here's the son of a failed grocer from Yorba Linda being told by the son of a polished senator from Connecticut that he can go up and represent Richard Nixon in this zip code. That appealed to Nixon. Bush understood how to reach Nixon. So Nixon thought about it while Bush was off getting his office, calls him back in and says, no, you're going to the UN. Um, the next job uh, was being Republican national chairman during Watergate. What second prize? Um, <laughs> but he, and that's the origin, if you want to draw a line, to the wimp factor. 
because Nixon decided Bush wasn't really tough enough because Bush wasn't willing to go out and cut every Nixon enemy throat. And so, and he talks about it. He says he thinks I'm not a, he thinks I'm not a killer. You clearly admire uh, President Bush. He yeah. clearly admires you. Was there any moment as you're working on this and you're writing this where you cringe and say, boy, I wish I didn't know that? Yeah. Um, I wish he had, um, I think he committed a sin of pride in picking Dan Quayle. Um, it was his first executive decision uh, to be, be made totally on his own since he went on the ticket with Reagan. He never sat down with Jim Baker and Atwater and Ailes and Mossbacher and Nick Brady and said, here are the choices, what do you think? He wanted to surprise them because he didn't want to be handled. And I just think, yeah, Vice President Quayle was very kind to me in this project. He's a lovely man. And more prepared than people gave him credit for at the time, although it was a bad rollout. It w to, to call that a bad rollout is like <laughs> calling the Second World War an unpleasantness. Um, uh, Jesus, God, listen to you. You really have gone centrist. Um, GMA has a big audience. Um, how are the Indiana numbers? Um, no, it was, he, but he was 41 years old. Right. Uh, he looked younger, and there was no preparation. You know, Jim Pinkerton, who was working for the Bush campaign, had to go send a staffer out to a local bookstore, which we approve of, by the way, uh, to buy the almanac of American politics and Xerox the pages about quail to give to the press. Um, and the one, and it was actually one of our few sort of unpleasant moments together. We were sitting on the porch together at, at Walker's Point, and I was sort of chasing him around a little bit. I was saying, all right, you've got Jim Baker, the gold standard. You've got Atwater. You've got all these people around you. You've got Mrs. Bush. You've got George W. And you never just sat down and said, hey, who would you put on the ticket? And he had a pair of binoculars, and he was looking out, which I... You know, I'm, I'm a subtle guy, so I, I pick up on signals. Mm -hmm. So he's doing this while I'm sitting where George is sitting, and I'm thinking, maybe this question isn't going over very well. Um, and finally, he put it down, and he said, sometimes you just don't want people telling you what to do all the time. And that was a sin of pride. And was Dan Quayle really the best man to potentially become president if the unthinkable happened? In a, in a field where you had Bob Dole and Jack Danforth and Alan Simpson uh, being vetted? I think that's an interesting question. So there's that. I don't think he spent a great deal of time on his Supreme Court appointments. Um, he thinks that Souter was a, quote, huge mistake. Um, he's very proud of Justice Thomas uh, to this day. Sorry, I know it's the 92nd Street Y, but, <laughs> you know. I have so not. anybody who thinks that Souter, that he kind of didn't mind having a closet moderate on the court is just wrong. A quote. It's a dry, I remember we were sitting at lunch, and I said, let's talk about Souter and Thomas. He went, uh, huge mistake, <laughs> huge mistake. Um, and, and I wish he had been more forthcoming and had been a better advisor in real time and then more truthful about Iran-Contra. Out of the loop. Out of the loop. He was in the loop. Um, you have to believe that Cap Weinberger, George Schultz, uh, were just totally inventing uh, their version of events to believe that Bush wasn't in the loop. And he was an old spy master. He was a realist. He, he wanted to support Reagan. Um, I wish he, um, you know, he denied it offhand. He denied it categorically. He said, we've never, you know, we didn't sell arms to Iran. And then it, it's weird, it's classic George Bush, because some days he would say, well, I'm just not going to tell you what the advice was. And then some days he would say, but I had reservations because it was through a third government. Um, so I think, to me, it's, it's the black mark of, of the record. I wish uh, that he had not ended the war at 100 hours. I wish he had taken out more of Saddam's armor. Um, I wish that he had not encouraged the uprisings, the ethnic uprisings in Iraq, and then failed to um, support them. 
Uh, Brent Scowcroft is pretty tough on him about that. He thinks that Bush just got excited about mm -hmm. come up, and, you know, if you rise up and then the Shiites. And he's tough, and I want to get to the questions that all of you have in a second, but he's tough on Vice President Cheney, yeah. on, on, on Don Rumsfeld, who he always had a, t a, a difficult r relationship with. But how hard was it to get him to talk about that? Um, did he realize the kind of impact it would have? He started, he, I asked about it forever, of course, and, you know, and got the look. Um, there, were, there were two funny things that the people who worked for him always talked about. One was the, the look that said, if you're so smart, why am I president of the United right. States and you're not? Um, and <laughs> Obama's the other, good at that. And the other, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, your, your guy probably was too. Um, uh, and the other was, and Brent Scowcroft told me, uh, Boyd and Gray told me this, that the, the hand gesture you lived in mortal fear of was the thumb doing this on the desk, because it meant, I know exactly what you're saying. Do you have anything else that's actually useful for me? Um, so he was a caring boss and a good boss, but a, t a tough one. Um, this is a, an audience that I think will, will bear with me on the weeds of the Rumsfeld thing. Mm -hmm. You all know, okay, so, so the, I'm oh, sorry, let me finish answering your, you, the question on the Cheney stuff. Um, it was October 2008 when he first said that, that he thought Cheney had contributed too much to the hawkish tone of the administration, that he had pushed too hard to widen the war on terror past- Built the empire. Build an empire, which was the exact opposite of the vice presidency that Bush had, had had. Bush treated the vice presidency as a senior confidential advisor without portfolio. Cheney treated it as a policy making, policy advocacy. It was like having an AEI in the White House, basically. Um, and I remember, I remember very clearly, I was sitting in the chair that he sat in as vice president. You get to keep your chairs. <laughs> and he had a bunch of them. He had all those jobs in the cabinet room. So, you know, it's, someday you could be vice president, someday you could be UN ambassador, it's kind of fun. <laughs> For somebody like me, it's like Dork Epcot. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I'd be like, oh, I think I want to be CIA director today. Um, but I remember sitting in that chair and nearly falling out of it because, and I knew what the first 72 hours of this rollout would be. It turns out it's the first 10 days um, because it was the first direct criticism of Cheney. And then he criticized his son. Uh, and he, he said um, that his, his son's rhetoric had been too harsh at times. And I said, well, what are you thinking of? And he says, the axis of evil, um, I think will be shown to be historic, classic George Bush formulation, I think will be shown to not historically benefit anything. Um, and then I took all of this to Rumsfeld, and then Rumsfeld just, he, threw under the bus completely. Uh, swagger, iron ass. Uh, Arrogant. Kick ass, to take names. Um, uh, in that kind of staccato voice. But I took everything to everyone involved, including anyone mentioned in the diaries, um, because I wanted, I wanted this to be history, not journalism. And um, George W. Bush was surprised. Uh, he said, my father never said any of this to me during the presidency or after. He copped to the fact that his rhetoric could be hot at times. Um, and then he joked, he said, but they understood me in Midland. And I think that given the context, the years those comments were made, which was 08, 09, 10, 11, and it was a series of conversations. So these were not drive-by quotations. Um, it was when Iran was in the news in a big way. And I think the President, President Bush, 41, feared that the Cheney wing was pushing to expand the war on terror past Afghanistan and Iraq. I do believe that 41 and 43 were closer together on the substance of well, that's Iraq. That's one of the things that you write in the book that I think does clear up a lot. Because at the time, people believed that in some ways 41 was sort of was sending out Brent Scowcroft and Jim Baker yeah. to as a proxy for his own views on yeah. how the, the the coalition was not being put together yeah. at the time. And it, gives, it leads to a question from uh, someone out in the audience, um, which is has a misconception in the beginning. The father felt the invasion of Iraq was a big mistake, which he did not, he did at not. least in his letters to, to President Bush. But why wasn't he more honest with his son 
in advising about the war overall or not being open about these other kinds of criticisms? Both, both men told me they didn't have these conversations. Does that mean they didn't have them? I, I can only report what the, the... Don't you believe they didn't have them? I do. As part of Bush's 41's code not to... I, I believe that there, it's possible that you and I have now talked more about this than they did. I really do. I, I, and, it, it's a, and it's an interesting intersection of a kind... You know, it's, it's like nitrogen and glycerin. They're okay apart, but you put them together. So Bush 41 has a code of def deference to the sitting president, which he began with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he learned it from his father. His father, play his father was Dwight Eisenhower's favorite golf partner in the Senate because he could go play golf with Prescott Bush and Prescott would never bring up business and they could just play golf. And it was genuinely relaxing. And I think he learned something from that. So he never challenged a sitting president. Um, he did call on Nixon to resign. I don't mean to make him out to be a, a sycophant, but he was making, unless it was an existential crisis, he was not going to go tell Evans and Novak what he really thought in order to win a headline, which is totally antiquated. Again, it's like talking about you know, Achilles in his tent now, it's so far away. Um, so that code ex extended to his son, and I defy anybody to spend five minutes with George W. Bush and think that he was really open to a lot of advice. <laughs> um, I really do. I think that he thought that the cataclysm of 9-11 had fundamentally changed America's strategic environment, that he had a vision of what he wanted to do. He wanted to keep weapons of mass destruction out of the hands of terrorists. This is what he decided to do. I'm sorry to say this, or I, I just got to say it. He got reelected on this. Sorry. Uh, I don't think maybe we'll mark you down as undecided. <laughs> um, uh, but this was adjudicated in the 2004 election. And so, but I don't think, in 2002, there was a conversation at Camp David where George W. walks him through all the diplomacy, walks him through everything, and President Bush, 41, says, if the man won't comply, you have to do what you have to do. Then he wrote him a letter when the operation was, was launched. And remember, this, is an old, this man was CIA director. He didn't write anything down he didn't expect to someday see. And so I think he believed with a lot of the country early on that Iraq was not an irrational thing to do. He did have private anxieties. One of the few blind quotes I have in the book is from a, a, a very good friend, a source I trust implicitly, uh, of the presidents who said that he had anxieties, but that his confidence in and love for his son overwhelmed those and that he was willing to put his trust in George W. Let's talk about... Uh, President Bush and President Clinton, and there's a two-part question here, but let me preface it with a couple of <laughs> observations and questions. Number one, 1992, 41 deeply believes, despite the fact, as you write, that he wasn't even sure he wanted to run again, despite the fact that he'd been battling Graves' disease and a depression, he firmly believes that the country will not choose Bill Clinton right. over him. Why? Right. Because he had not served in Vietnam, and the... He was less worried about the woman stuff. Uh, you know, uh, after Gary, he, he was sort of rooting for Gary Hart against the press in 1987. And he sort of rooted for Clinton against the press in 92. Um, he didn't think that if, if personal foibles, unless they affected your, your public uh, uh, actions, w w mattered that much. Um, but the draft dodging, as he put it, was a big deal to him. Uh, the letter to Colonel Holmes, all that. I'm, you're going to have PTSD in a second. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. <laughs> uh, I don't mean, but he, 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 he said to, um, he just didn't believe that Bill Clinton had the character that would impress enough of the American people to elect him president. And then Bill Clinton defeats him. Um, you could think a guy would hold that against him forever. And somehow they become as close as you can be. Well, I want to ask you this. I mean, I mean, Bill Clinton is 
one of the most charming men when he wants to be, mm -hmm. right, uh, in the world. If I'm right that George Bush can be one of the most charming men, though they are totally different. Uh, one of my favorite remarks that uh, 41 made about Clinton, and I ended up italicizing it in the book, was Bush saying, you know, I like Bill, but he talks all <laughs> the time. He says, and who the hell knows if he's right? He says, there are 142 windmills in Nigeria. George, we need to get 32 more. And how do you know? <laughs> what do you, I don't understand. The other, the other great one is um, when, uh, when George W., who's responsible for this, because it started with Sent them to the tsunami, tsunami relief. Indonesia, tsunami right? relief. So, so they walk in. So Bush, 41, and uh, Clinton walk into the, uh, uh, one of the embassies, of the uh, Indonesian embassy, I guess, in Washington, oh, yeah. to sign the book. Do you know the story? And um, there's a beautiful landscape on the wall. And Clinton looks up and says, that is a beautiful picture. Who painted that? And the way 41 tells the story says, oh, that's Umbunga. He's our great landscape artist. And, and Clinton goes, that's great. And they walk up and they sign the book and then they come back down and one of the other consul generals was with them who had not been down there before. And Clinton grabs the, the new guy and says, that is my favorite Umbunga. <laughs> I've seen a lot of Umbungas. <laughs> 41 can tell this story over three, it takes three Bloody Marys. Uh, so I think part of the attraction is that they are the odd couple. I mean, right. here's, here, Georgia H, and you've done this too. Uh, blessedly, because I've been so lucky in my life, I, I've spent time with, talked with, every president of my lifetime, I guess, except Nixon and Reagan. And when you talk to a president, and you bring up the weather. Usually within 3.2 seconds, they will bring up what the weather had been like when they were president <laughs> right. and how much better it was <laughs> when they were president. <laughs> you have to take a squash racket and beat George Herbert Walker Bush about the head to get him to talk about being president. Bill Clinton, not so much. <laughs> um, so I think that there's kind of the opposite. I, now, I'm, what I'm interested in from your point of view is I know that Bush is amused by him. What do you think Clinton sees in Bush? I think he sees what you saw in your book, a, a, a gentleman who put the country first and who took him in, who after that campaign like that, still found a way yeah. to embrace him. And I think that, and that, and you, and you can't, I think, underestimate the club, the yeah. club thing. Yeah. These guys both know what it's like. It does lead to this question though, um, which you also get into in the book, were you surprised that 41 felt distant from Hillary Clinton? Oh, this is a classic George Bush line. He says, we like Hillary, but we don't know her. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the reasons it took 17 years to write this book. Um, I think, I don't know this. Now I sound like him. Uh, I think, but I don't know that um, that she sees it as more cynical. I have this gut feeling that she sees it as some kind of cynical political relationship um, and that she doesn't forgive as easily um, mm -hmm. and pro may remember moments as when, you know, he was out there calling them bozos. And um, now Bush 41 did write a letter to Clinton in 06 saying we're gonna to have to cool it for a while because Hillary was about to run for president by basically making a case against the years of his son. And he said, you know, we're gonna to have to cool it. They didn't, of course. Um, but it is striking that Senator Clinton has never gone to Walker's Point. Uh, Clinton comes a couple of times a year, as Barbara will tell you, because mm -hmm. he talks all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask you a question about Jeb before we get to one more yeah. from the audience. It's, it's, it's clear in, the, in your telling of the story from their perspective that the, the, both George and Barbara resist this notion that they had somehow yeah. chosen Jeb yeah. over George W. In, in back in 1994, uh, but that George W. still harbors 
a little bit of resentment yeah. that they were more upset over Jeb's loss in 94 yeah. than W's, happy for W's victory. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, I mean, this is where it's all the house of Atreus, yeah. Um, it, it, it's fascinating. Um, 40, um, let, me, let me give 43 credit for this, because this is 43's theory of the whole case, which makes sense to me. He's, because I asked him, I said, you know, Jeb was supposed to be president, not you. Everybody thinks that. Tell me why it's not true. And he said, well, the origin of it is probably that Jeb grew up faster. They're seven years apart because Robin was in the middle and, 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 and was lost. Um, so as George W. himself says, he's, he, he was a little bit more of an uncle early on than a, than a brother. And then he went off to Andover and then they haven't really lived anywhere near each other for decades. Um, but he said, you know, Jeb fell in love early, went through college in two and a half years, had his babies early, moved to Florida. He was a much more serious guy. And as George W. has said famously, when I was young and irresponsible, I was young and irresponsible. Uh, Jim Baker told me that uh, George W. was damn near a juvenile delinquent. Um, and he just, if you had looked in the 1970s at these two guys, you would have thought, you know what, I bet Jeb is probably the more serious person. What that doesn't take into account and what puzzles me, and one piece of news in the book is, as early as 1972, George W. was looking at running for the state senate in Houston. Uh, in 1978, he did run for the House, famously, uh, out in Midland and lost leading his father to write him a letter in 1977 that laid out the code we've been talking about, which is George H.W. Bush saying, you have to be your own man. You have to take positions that are contrary to mine. I'll be there and campaign for you if you need me. I'll stay away if that helps more. It was exactly the way he acted when he ran for president, when George W. ran for president. So if this was some dynastic plot, it started back in 1977. Um, the, the 1994 story is really interesting, but George, again, I credit George W. He, he says that on, George W. was upset because basically he's taking a phone call, he's just been elected governor of Texas, and all his parents want to talk about is how sad they are about Jeb losing in Florida. But as he put it, as 43 put it to me, on reflection, it's kind of classic George Bush. You're, to, to sympathize with the loser. And I credit that theory because on the night the Supreme Court closed down the Florida recount, George H.W. Bush is watching television. He watches Al Gore concede the presidency. Yeah. He picks up the phone and calls the White House switchboard and says, this is George Bush Sr. I would like to speak to Vice President Gore. Gore takes the call on his mobile phone and he says, I, George H.W. Bush says to Al Gore, that's the most patriotic and dignified thing I've seen in my public life. I've lost, I know what this feels like, I just want you to know that I'm hurting for you too. Al Gore told me that story, not George Bush. Al Gore told me that story. Mm. Final question will give you a chance to make your case for 41's place in history, which he describes famously to you now as an asterisk, but here's the question. Uh, George H.W. Bush was probably one of the best prepared people to serve in the office of the presidency, yet in office he exhibited no vision and seemed to not understand the power of the presidency. Would you comment on this statement? I love the 92nd Street Watch. <laughs> <laughs> it's a broad mosaic. <laughs> I, I ask him about the, uh, the, vi the vision thing a lot, and it, it was a very sweet answer at one point. He said, what's wrong with trying to help people? Isn't that vision enough? And which I, I kind of agree with. Um, he was a steward, not a seer. He was not Ronald Reagan. He was not Theodore Roosevelt. He was not Franklin Roosevelt. But there is a quieter kind of heroism, a quieter kind of leadership. Let's look at what happened quickly in his four years. The Berlin Wall comes down. Well, Tiananmen Square first. He manages that relationship with China. He continues us on a path toward a, a more secure uh, relationship with China. Uh, that's in June. Uh, the Berlin Wall falls. We forget that Tiananmen was part of the ambient reality 
of the thinking because they had just seen a repressive government crack down on demonstrators. He handles the fall of the wall with effortless grace, with people, like, with people saying, oh, he doesn't understand the poetry of the fall of the wall. That's one of the most insane things you can possibly say. This is a man shaped by the Cold War, a man who was nearly killed because of the force and rise of nationalism and, and ideology around the world. He understood the Cold War. He understood what it meant when that wall fell down. But half, half Bush knew, and he put himself in the shoes of Gorbachev, and realized that Gorbachev had hardliners to deal with. And Bush had hardliners to deal with. Arguably, Bush was better at helping Gorbachev with his hardliners than Bush was taking care of Gingrich at all on his right. Um, so if I had told you in 1980 that the Berlin Wall would fall, Germany would be reunified over the objections of Margaret Thatcher and Francois Mitterrand, who accepted Churchill's view that the Hun is always at your feet or at your throat. Uh, they were very worried about this. He reunifies Germany. He supports Gorbachev. Some people say he supported him too long. My view is the Soviet Union's gone, so that's, uh, we can argue about that a little bit. But uh, ultimately, Gorbachev was the right bet. Um, and at home, he passed significant domestic legislation that was largely involved the public sector that he tried to make as conservative as possible. One of the pieces, here's, here's a category you don't hear much, good political science, but there's some really interesting political science, which is like French military victory, <laughs> small category, um, that, I'll wait, it's okay. <laughs> it was worth a second, uh, in which, um, he was, I lost that one, sorry. Uh, <laughs> good political science. Good political science. His, you've done this before. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. Public opinion was the same in 1989 to 1983, 1993 as it was in the middle of the Eisenhower years. So my argument about Bush's place in history, very briefly put, is that he is an Eisenhower figure whose conservatism was based on preserving what was best about the country, reforming what he could, and recognizing limitations. Um, and the world, which could have become incredibly, a lot, lot messier, a lot faster, if he had handled things differently, ultimately was passed on to Bill Clinton in terms of foreign policy, I think you'll agree, in a lot better shape than it might have otherwise been. And the economy was too. And with the help of a lot of uh, biographers, uh, Eisenhower's place in history was revised, and I think destiny and power is going to begin that process with George Bush. John, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks,